What's good, everybody? I'm Jay Webb, and of course, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Over Quota. Please don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review if you haven't already. My goal, as I say always, so if you're a first-time listener, this is for you specifically. If you've been listening in the past, feel free to fast forward this about 30 or 40 seconds, but I'm going to repeat it for the people who are just tuning in. My goal is to give listeners a variety of perspectives and insight from sales leaders who have a proven track record of exceeding expectations for themselves and or their teams, realizing, of course, that not one person has all of the answers. And like always, the J. David Group, which is my company, will be sponsoring this podcast. Uh, my company helps high growth software companies recruit top software sales leaders and salespeople. So go to the jdavidgroup.com forward slash hiring to learn more or go to the jdavidgroup.com forward slash looking if you're looking for your next big challenge. Now, my guest today is Jeff Hoffman. He's a seasoned sales leader and founder of Rapid Sales Revenue, which is a CRO advisory firm focused on revenue strategy and the process to ensure top line performance is sustainable and scalable. Jeff, welcome to Overquota. Thank you very much, Jay. Pleasure to be here. So let's start with what I just ended with. Give me the 30,000 foot view, I guess, if you will, of the Jeff Hoffman um, backstory, and then also what rapid sales revenue um, helps its clients do. Sure. Well, I spent uh, about 15 years selling enterprise software for the likes of IBM, Oracle, some smaller companies, uh, a company called Vitria, another one called Essential, which got bought by IBM. Uh, and then in 2008, I really wanted to do something more strategic. So I found opportunities to get into management and uh, I did that with a, uh, a company in, uh, out of uh, Belgium, uh, had a, a risk regulatory reporting solution for, for the finance industry. Um, they were seeking visibility and uh, building out North America. And I helped them do that by running North America. Then I ran a large underperforming sales team at SunGuard when, when it was run by Silver Lake uh, for a couple of years. And, and then they sold the company to FIS. From there, I, I ran sales for North America at a UK based company uh, out of, uh, based out of London. And uh, they were similarly to SunGuard, they were looking for fixing underperformance. Um, then I formed my advisory firm. The backstory is really after years and years of sales and management, I realized what's missing with a lot of these enterprise software companies, in my opinion, was there was a lack of qualified deals in a CRM system. And I felt that I should demystify the CRM system with an advisory firm that helped keep companies on track. And so I, I codified all the processes that I felt were inherent on building copious revenue plans and, and impact messaging, as well as making sure salespeople were working on real deals with you know, proven steps uh, to get deals closed and, and make sure that they're closed in forecasted timelines. And that's really the, the, the impetus of what my advisory firm is all about. Yeah, when you say codified sales process, tell me a little bit more about that. What, what did you find and how did you um, package it, so to speak, in a way that, that could be distilled and, and implemented no matter where, who you yeah. work with? So I break it into four categories uh, and the, the two large categories are strategy and the execution on the strategy. Within strategy, you've got what I call impact messaging. A, 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 lot, of, uh, a, a lot of what's missing in a lot of these uh, tech companies is making sure that the folks, the salespeople and anyone else involved in supporting the efforts to go out and find, cultivate, and win business, that they actually understand what they're selling. Why would anyone buy? Why would they buy from us? And why would they buy from us now? Uh, I, I created an algorithm that would keep people on track and, and the delineation of going through that, that set of questions enables companies to really understand uh, more implicitly you know, what their value is first and foremost, and then why would anyone buy and, and what their, their added advantages over the competitors in the marketplace. If you don't have that down first, it's very difficult to be working on real deals and, and get them executed or closed in the right timelines. The other piece is once you understand your value for the market, 
understanding how you go to market, you know, how do you sell? Are you in a company where you, 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 you have to first obviously know how much revenue you want to obtain, but once you, you understand what that number is, do you want to sell direct? Do you want to sell uh, using partnerships through an indirect model? And when you, when you figure out the right, you know, uh, combination of direct and or potentially indirect sales, understanding who's going to buy from us allows you to build out the right companies to, to build territories around so that when you're hiring salespeople, you know what kind of real inherent skills you need in those people, uh, the kinds of companies, you already know what kinds of companies are going to buy from you. So you're not relying on the salespeople to determine for you where they know people and, and who they want to sell to. You're going to help, you're going to help support them and give them the, the toolkit of companies that they're going to go sell into. On the strategy side, you also need to look at what your pricing model looks like. If it's a SaaS company or, or not, you need to know, is it understandable to the customer and is it understandable to the salespeople who are actually selling the software? Can they articulate the pricing model? You also want to know whether the margins make sense so that you can get to your number. That's the strategy. On the execution side, the biggest piece is sales process. Now I created an algorithm that's predicated on three variables, a forecasting model, six staged events, and a working closed document. The, the, when, you, when you work through these three variables from a coaching perspective, you can get to the heart per deal on helping your sales force and any internal resources that are supporting your, your sales force know whether they're working on real deals, uh, know what the right steps are to take to get those deals closed and know really accurately, know from a much more accurate perspective when you can forecast those deals because you've gone through a process that includes figuring out, you know, where to, where to forecast the deal based on communicating uh, the, the staged events when you're going through each deal with the rep and using the working document to add, subtract, make changes, make sure that you're, you're asking the right questions, you know who the buyers are in the, in the accounts, know who the competitors are, and it keeps you on track. So that the sales process needs to be transparent and uh, that's what I've created in, in terms of codification um, to ensure that those deals are moving swiftly through a sales cycle uh, and, and getting closed in, in a timely fashion. When you say timely, obviously that's relative depending on perhaps the industry, the company, the price points, the go-to-market strategy, as you just alluded to um, in the past. Um, how does process, or having the right process impact, um, you know, perhaps shortening sales cycles? It's, uh, it's really everything. Uh, I, I can't tell you how many times I've been in meetings that I call we wish meetings internal, whether it's a sales manager talking to a sales rep or a, a C-level executive talking to their management teams and the salespeople. If there is no uh, uh, transparency to knowing step by step where there might be a black hole in a deal or a dark spot in a deal and you're not staying on top of that just like exercise on a weekly basis in terms of the communication that the uh, the management teams are, are providing to the, uh, the 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 account sales individuals if that's not happening daily the, the, the sales cycles are going to not be short they're going to be long sales cycles and the deals are going to potentially be incorrectly forecasted in terms of the timeline or they might not even be real deals to begin with so especially if it's a funded company and you've got a crm system of revenue if that's not accurate and real it's a catastrophe waiting to happen yeah that makes sense uh, and give me a sense of the size of companies that you're typically um in, engaging um at your company right. so through my llc i've tried to focus on companies that are what I call in the growth uh, phase, uh, meaning they're probably, if they're, if they're organically making money, they're probably in the uh, 20 to 
50 to $75 million range on the organic uh, revenue side. If they're funded, they're in a similar zone, somewhere between 20, 25 million in funding to 75 million in funding. These are what I call growth companies. They're not early stage, but they're certainly not that mature in the marketplace yet. Where are they in their sales, as far as a sales organization, when you engage them um, yeah, yeah. in terms of, yeah, just where are they? Like in terms of, I guess, number of salespeople, their go-to market strategy, has it been, do they think they've figured it out, but yet they really haven't? And then you need to come in and help them think yeah, through that yeah. and change that. Right. Give me a sense of that. Well, it could be uh, a few different uh, scenarios and you kind of alluded to all of them. Uh, first and foremost, the sales force could be anywhere from five to 20 people, I would say on average. Uh, the problems that these companies are, are typically dealing with uh, are, are, are on the spectrum from we need to gain visibility and, and grow our market share to we've had a team in place. We've been in the market for a few years. We're underperforming. I don't know if it's the sales force uh, uh, or something's missing. So there's an assessment that needs to happen on why is their underperformance as it relates to their top line. Uh, and another scenario that factors in is it could be a company that's looking to uh, either add a new product to their existing offering and they want to commercialize a new, a new offering into the mix and they want to gain some knowledge on either due diligence as it relates to commercializing that new, that new uh, solution set. Uh, these are the uh, scenarios. Got it. Yeah. Okay. And what, so let, let's just say you first engage whether, and by the way, this could be either with a client of your advisory firm, or it could be, let's say for instance, one of the companies that you've turned around uh, in the past, right? Where, where you, where you've, you've um, come on as the sales leader and started to turn things around um, to eventually get them acquired. Right. So, so when you Correct. first come in as a new sales leader, like what must, you do to drive results um, in, in, the, in, in how long does it typically take yeah, to now, assessing the, the, the new sure. opportunity? Sure, I, I think the, well, that's a great question. Uh, the first thing you gotta do is you have to assess where the gotchas are, where are the potential you know, loopholes or, or inherent problems. And uh, I do it by actually taking those processes I talked about to look under the trash cans around strategy and understand uh, first and foremost, how have they been going to market? What is the messaging currently? How many customers do they actually have? How much revenue have they generated? Uh, what has their sales cycle looked like to date in terms of start to finish? Uh, can I shorten that sales cycle? How many wins are there? And how many deals have they worked on? This is the most important bit I find. How many deals have they really worked on that they lost? When you start to analyze that data, uh, you can then start to put process in place to fix and uh, ensure top line grows. What I, you know, from on a, on a, on a more specific point of uh, perspective, you know, the, it's very important to very quickly figure out uh, how you're going to find uh, companies that see value in the solution. And you want to make sure that the, the solution is impactful in the marketplace. But assuming that it is impactful, you want to fix the messaging if you need to. And then look at who's going to really care about it and... Um, communicate that value as fast as you can. Uh, and if you're looking at um, helping salespeople be better as well, then you want to understand and coach and mentor each individual because everybody learns differently. You want to be able to spend time with each individual and understand what's been working in their minds for them and what's been challenging and sort that out and start to figure out how can you make them better? How can you take your sales process program and help them get better at what they do well and fill in the gaps on where they're weak and um, and start coaching on a weekly basis per deal. 
when you say messaging, fixing the messaging or just get an understanding of the messaging, who is actually doing that? Are, you're, are you as the CRO or sales leader doing that? Or are you bringing in um, you know, somebody from marketing to, to, yeah, to help me with that? How does that work? Great question. I think it's a combination. Um, I, I think anybody who's heading up a sales uh, team or sales organization should know how to proactively look at the solution that's that's uh, being offered to the market and take the uh, the offering and then kind of derive the the messaging themselves for the for the sales force but it certainly helps if there's a marketing person uh, you know on staff who you can work with proactively a lot of times marketing people have a certain way of uh, thinking about the, the, um, the market impact of the offering, but they don't have it derived in such a way that it helps salespeople go directly to the audience that they need to sell to, uh, to, to make it work. So being able to, uh, as a CRO or a head of sales, being able to sit with the marketing person, ask them a lot of questions to make sure you're both on the same page, then collectively you can you can you can usually build out a smart go-to-market message that salespeople can use uh, in terms of you know why are we buy, why are people buying who's really the audience uh, group that buys and um, you know why would they buy from us now versus doing nothing or buy from our competitors versus us. So it helps if you have the collaboration, but if you don't, I think someone running sales should be taking a very proactive, uh, you know, approach to getting their sales force geared towards the right message. What are the indicators then that tell you that the messaging isn't right? And how soon do you, how do you go about collecting that data? So yeah. to speak, and how soon do you know? It, it, it's kind of like a, a pendulum, you know? you know it's not right if you've got deals that sit in, in, in a CRM system that are not going anywhere. Uh, whereas, you know, the, the, uh, the people that are supposed to be buying the software, obviously they're not, they're not doing the deals. And if these deals keep slipping, you know there's a problem somewhere. It could be that you've got the wrong people selling. It could be that, uh, you know, the starting point is that the message is just not resonating in the market. It could be that the product itself doesn't really have enough value in the market, and that's a whole nother ball of wax. But uh, the way to evaluate is to look at, over a period of historical data clips, quarter over quarter, year over year, and look at it over a, you know, a one, to two, two, one to three year period. When you start looking at historical data clips, to see wins and losses, you know, opportunities that people worked on, the wins and the losses, and you start quantifying that data, that's when you start to look at where's the issue. And a lot of times the issue is that the, the impact is just not being understood by the buyers. And when you say, so just to clarify, when you say messaging, is this as it pertains to in-deal sales process? Or are you saying messaging in terms of filling top of funnel, driving leads? Because one of the things I heard uh, you say in that explanation too, as well, is that, you know, it could be um, just the, um, you know, quali qualifying, for instance, right? In other words, if, if there are a bunch of uh, deals, so to speak, sitting in the CRM and they're not closing, they're not moving forward and they're just sort of stuck there. Uh, right. Is that qualifying or are you saying that there's a messaging problem within the sales process uh, in terms of they're not communicating uh, properly or often enough or yeah. another asking the right questions? Like, tell me about that. Right. And another great uh, point you bring up. At a very, very high level, the, the first messaging issue you want to look at is are salespeople creating qualified opportunities to put into the funnel, to put into the CRM system? Are they real? Do buyers really show interest and understand the value of the offering and, and see it as something that's going to improve their environment? That's mm -hmm. first and foremost. So there's the issue of qualifying. Once the deal is in a CRM, 
there could be a, sep a subset issue that you need to focus on, which is helping the salespeople uh, actually sell and, and figure out how to improve their, um, their, their sales process once they've got some real deals that are actually in the CRM. You might then have a secondary problem, which is, you know, do, they under do the salespeople understand what questions to ask and statements to make throughout the cycle to ensure that A, they're, they're, they're taking a real deal and moving it forward so that it can get closed. Um, so there's that secondary issue. But the first issue is really, can you go find real opportunities with, does the message resonate in the marketplace? And once you've determined that, assuming that it works, then you gotta help salespeople with the process of asking the right questions and making the right statements to their potential buyers uh, you know, to, uh, to make sure that um, they're working on real opportunities that can get closed in real timelines. What about um, when you, you know, don't necessarily have the right process there? And obviously, I'm sure that's why they're hiring you, right? Because they don't have the right process to, be, to begin with. And you mentioned maybe you have the wrong people. Like, how do you go about implementing and communicating change right and let's just face it humans are always reluctant to change right, right. um and, and and you know sales is hard enough so how do you if, to go about doing it in an effective way that um you know to, to get it done i guess yeah well i remember when i uh worked at a large uh, fintech vendor i uh, had a big sales team and the, the the mode of operandi was uh we have sales people that just are not uh, doing a great job. You might want to look at these people and, and make a change. And I, I personally, you know, like to give everybody an opportunity, including myself. I want us all to win. I want the whole world to win. I don't want to, I don't like walking into environments and, and, you know, being the bearer of bad news. I, I think the most important thing, uh, gets back to what I was saying earlier. You want to look at each individual, uh, and start understanding where they're, what deals they're working on and ask them a lot of questions. As a leader, you want to in, in both, you want to first of all, build a relationship with them uh, where to the point where they see you as a trusted, you know, a trusted advisor to them, someone they can rely on and go to. I like to, in the environments that I worked at when I was in leadership positions, I wanted to get to know the salespeople individually per their deals and understand are they wh why are these deals in their minds real what needs to happen in order to move them forward how can i help them move them forward if i discern through th that type of uh communication that they might not be the right fit or they meaning they they just can't get coached uh on where the weakness might be then you have to swiftly make a change and um so the combination of understanding uh, do you have the right person selling into the right territory? You know, some people are uh, better at upselling into existing accounts. Other people are, are really good at creating market share in, in brand new logo accounts. Uh, some people are good at both. Making sure through the evaluation of the individual salesperson that you have the right individual in the right territory is step one coaching them on deals that are in the CRM to feel comfortable that they are doing the right things or can they be coached and mentored on, on the weaknesses or not. And then you, you can make a change from there. But these are the starting points to helping you discern whether or not you've got the right team in place and are you going to market into the right territories with the right people you know, on the right accounts. How do you know someone is the wrong person for the wrong account for the wrong territory? Well, I've, been a, I've always been a big believer that, um, you know, I think sales is a team sport. It's not, it's really not a sport for, uh, you know, cowboys. Uh, people that um, don't want help from anyone other than themselves. Uh, I, I find that that's usually a recipe for disaster unless they are just winning business left and right. And then in that case, you just leave them, leave them alone. But I think in, in, innately, we're in an, in an industry of communicating. And the more transparency you have, the more team-oriented players that you actually have on board, the 
the better chance you have for success, just like a sport, um, you know, it's usually not just one person and, and, and a manager. It's usually a team of salespeople. Everyone can learn from one another. I can learn from people that work for me, with me. I can learn from, we can all learn from each other. And I, I think um, there's often a flag will go up if I, if I recognize someone doesn't want to participate in the communication. In the communication, so that's more, so it, it sounds to me like regardless of which territory that they're in, they're probably not going to be a good fit if it's something that is more of a cultural thing, cultural fit, I suppose, as opposed to someone that's in the wrong territory, right, in that case? Yeah, it, I mean, your, your question initially was, uh, how do you know you need to make a, a change uh, right away? I mean, I, I think I look at people who are team players, and that is a cultural issue, but everyone learns and everyone works differently. So uh, if you happen to have people on your team that are crushing it and, and they want to be left alone, then you leave them alone. But I find that for the most part, uh, most people um, are, are not like A plus players on, on their own. They, they need to strategize with other people. They need, they should be open to uh, being coached and mentored. And if they are, then there's a good chance you can help improve their performance so that they can go out and, and win business. Right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and basically, the, the, you mentioned one of the things is the territory it might be misaligned with the person. Um, and that sometimes the right person is in the wrong territory or vice versa. Is it a situation like maybe, uh, you know, maybe there's a headquarters, for instance, but the person is working remotely and maybe that's going to hinder or hamper the need for them to collaborate as opposed to somebody else who uh, frankly doesn't necessarily need um, as much, I don't know, collaboration or, or, or handholding and can do it more on their own, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the industry is, is actually pretty much remote. I mean, some, some, companies might have a bunch of people in an office location, but I think for the most part, uh, the collaboration is going to be with people around the country uh, doing, you know, Zoom type chats or phone chats. And there just needs to be good, strong communication. When you have a working closed document and you can stay on point with checks and balances, you can get to the heart or the root of uh, whether people are really working on real deals or not. And um, so I don't think it's so much about having every, everyone uh, together in the same office, although there's pluses to that, but you can certainly do collaboration remotely. Um, the territory alignment piece has more to do with uh, someone's style of communicating. Um, when you're in companies that have already bought from you and you're, you're leveraging those existing relationships into more relationships into that existing account, uh, there might be a, a softer style of communicating that somebody exudes when, when they're uh, talking to people within that company versus someone who's, who's going out and finding new business in, in places that have never bought from you before. The, the style there might be, uh, there might be a need to be slightly more aggressive, although I think in both scenarios, there's a lot of similarities, but that might be one differential where uh, you get to hiring people whose personalities match up to, uh, you know, the, the type of territory that they're, they're selling into. Got it. Yep. That makes sense. So let me ask you this. Um, do you need the right people to fit the process or do, or the right process to fit the people? Where, where do you put the more of the emphasis or importance? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I've always felt that in, innately you need transparency and, and the process that I've created ultimately creates transparency and it creates an open dialogue with individuals to figure out whether or not they understand how to articulate the message uh, and then and how to go out and actually sell it. Uh, so I, I think at the end of the day, there is no, I don't have a process that tries to box people in. In fact, it's just the opposite. My, my process, I think, 
it, it, it bodes for individuality and it, and it wants people in an organization culturally to feel that they can go about doing what they're doing individually and I am there using this codified process, if you will, uh, to help customize their approach to selling and to make each individual person, whether they're salespeople or in a supporting role to sales, better at their jobs, but utilizing their own style. I don't want to box people in to a, a process that makes people uncomfortable. I want to help make them feel that their individual style is going to shine more. I'm just there to help use the process as a, as a checks and balances, but then you really do need people uh, on board who have leadership skills and are empathetic and have humility so that those that are working with, with that kind of a per with, with, the, with the leader feel comfortable in going through the sets of questions uh, that'll help get them uh, better at winning business. And how do you motivate behavior, right? Like how do you motivate the right performance, especially if you're within a, let's say a, a, a private equity um, backed company where, you know, obviously it's, there's certainly a lot of pressure, right? And high pressure. Yeah. Like how do you motivate the right behaviors um, and, and more, frankly, just motivate people to perform? Yeah, I think everyone, uh, uh, everyone's got, got their own motivation. I think uh, one probably a key denominator for salespeople is they typically want to make money. That's why they're in sales roles. And, and then typically most salespeople uh, like talking to other people um, that might potentially buy or whatever. They're, they're, they're somewhat comfortable getting in front of people they don't know and, um, and talking. So the way you motivate behavior is, I think, by focusing on um, understanding where somebody feels confident and where they have uncertainty in their, in their um, approach or belief that they can win and succeed and hit their numbers and make money. And you have to ask almost like a, psych like a, a psychiatrist uh, or a PhD in psychology, you almost have to get into their heads and understand where they feel confident and help coach and mentor the confidence that they have. And the weakness, you wanna help them with the weakness. You wanna you want to try to pull the weakness apart. There might be something that someone's not good at, but there's a few things that they're really good at. So you wanna build up what they're really good at to help them stay highly motivated and still kind of coach them and mentor them on how you're going to work as a team with them to improve the weakness. And this is what I did and why I had success when I was running sales teams, uh, you know, at different uh, software companies. What about managing board expectations when, you know, they're, they're expecting your, you to deliver a certain yeah. result, uh, but yet how you're, what you're forecasting, giving the, given the data that you have and sort of, um, I guess, salespeople's expectations in terms of the numbers to, to achieve. Um, how do you manage up, so to speak, to the board to yeah. set the right expectations, but then also yeah. manage the team to motivate, keep, to, like my point, to keep them motivated to hit that number that might, yeah. um, frankly, might not be all that achievable? That's correct. Well, therein lies the rub. There, <laughs> therein lies the rub to the, to the whole industry. Um, and it is a balancing act. Um, and occasionally, you know, you fail, but uh, oftentimes you're trying to manage unrealistic uh, revenue expectations. Uh, and I find the best way to, you know, try to keep people motivated to hitting expectations is to go up and work with uh, your CEO uh, and and also the uh, the funder if they're if they're involved, the, the private equity or venture capital firm. Work with whoever the uh, funder person is that managing partner and try your best to um, protect your sales force by creating expectations that are more realistic so that they feel like they have a fighting chance but at the same time 
work with the sales force on shortening sales cycles and finding deals faster. So they've got a, a, a real opportunity that they feel in their hearts will allow them to make money and, and therefore hopefully, uh, you know, be sustainable over a long period of time. And, you know, uh, it's, it's that kind of um, balancing act. So complete this sentence for me then. A, a sales leader's ability to drive results is directly related to his or her ability to do what? Gain trust. I mean, most, most importantly, uh, you have to have the trust of the people that work for you, the people who you're working for, and anyone in between. Uh, you want to have an environment where, uh, you know, it, the data points are copacetic between you and your salespeople, uh, the managing partners of the, uh, the funders, the C-level uh, group that you work for. Everyone needs to feel that you are doing everything you can possibly be doing. There is a human element to this. Uh, I think it's difficult in general to uh, sell solutions that oftentimes oftentimes require some creativity uh, in, 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 in helping uh, an audience even understand why they could benefit from the solution. So you're building that, that vision, which takes time. Um, and there's a lot of uncertainty in general uh, selling enterprise software. So you've got to, uh, I think, go to work every day with humility and empathy and uh, most importantly, you want, of all the people that you want to tr want trusting you, you want the people that are helping you obtain the revenue. So that sales team, you want, you want those folks to feel like you are, uh, you know, not, not just their, their leader to help them bring in money, but somebody that they can, you know, confide in. And uh, because, you know, people are going to go through their days on a weekly basis and a monthly basis. And things are going to creep into their heads. And the more focused they are with positive energy, uh, the better chance you have for real success. So it's trust. And, okay. And what about um, your approach for grooming? You mentioned leaders, right? Grooming new sales leaders. Like what, what have, I'll, I'll ask it this way, what have the best salespeople done or what traits do they have what behaviors that they have um that uh that other people struggle with and then how can they make a smoother transition from individual contributor to become sales leaders yeah i think the traits that i've seen over the years that help define uh and separate uh, a, a really good salesperson from someone who might be mediocre is uh they tend to be organized with uh, their, their world of information that they need to understand. They, they tend to understand um, who's going to buy from them and why. They really understand how to price the solutions out and how to talk to their management teams about how they want to price out a solution. Uh, and when they're in front of customers or prospects, they know what questions to ask and what statements to make that will enable them to get correct data points that will allow them to then know that the deals they're putting in the CRM are real. Uh, I also find that really good salespeople tend to be good writers. I find that 70 to 75% of a deal cycle is oftentimes in email, uh, especially in the world we live in today. So no matter where you are in your cycle, you have to know what is the reason you're writing that email? What is the purpose of that note? I find that one of the most important things you can do, and I like to do if I'm, whether I was, whether I was in a company or if I'm advising a company, I think it's critical to be able to evaluate email communication from sales rep between salespeople and the bro and the prospects that they're trying to sell to uh, because a lot can be said and told in an email you might think that emails are simplistic but if they don't have an ask and 
deals go dark, a lot of times it's because those emails, that 75% are not communicating effectively to get the responses you need. So good salespeople are good email communicators, uh, written communicators, as well as doing the other things that I just suggested. Okay. And I think if you're going to, uh, you know, look at what it takes to then go to the next level, and, you know, the, the byproduct is if you do those well and uh, you go about it with a sense of humility and empathy because you, you understand that it's tough business, you know, sometimes people uh, can work super hard and have zero results. And sometimes people don't have to work hard at all and they just have deals that fall into the bucket. Um, when you have that inherent understanding that this is a tough business, it, it, it allows people to want, to want to communicate with you. It, it allows people to want to trust you. And I think this is something that's missing in a lot of uh, leadership people uh, and C-level people that are in a lot of these companies. They don't have the human element. Uh, they're not um, structured that way, uh, you know, in their brains. And I think it makes it hard for people to work for those types of individuals. You want to have positive motivation, you know, in order to build a winning culture. That's just my, my opinion, my, my perspective. So you're more of a carrot leader than a stick leader. <laughs> yeah, I've worked for the stick leaders and, uh, uh, even, even though there's probably a whole bunch of stick leaders out there that'll, uh, you know, tell you otherwise that, uh, fear is a good motivator. Um, I never, ever met another salesperson in my lifetime who loved the feeling of being in fear. Yeah. I'm with you there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's end it with what I'm calling now the rapid fire five. You guys, if you're listening to this, it's probably the third or fourth person that I've asked these questions. This is a new feature. Of course, the over quarter podcast where I ask five quick questions and to elicit five relatively quick answers just to sort of get um, a better understanding of, of my guests. So here we go. Um, your favorite sales enablement tool is what? Uh, my favorite sale, sales enablement tool is uh, the ability to feel confident that you know why people want your software. You know, why would they really b benefit from it? So just being able to understand the, the communication of why people want to buy it and that excites people, I think, when they're salespeople, they, they, the, the enablement of, uh, you know, knowing that they've got uh, a reasoning behind it. Now, if there's software in the marketplace that can help you do that, a content management tool that might help you uh, build that storyline even better, that might be a very cool tool to have. But I think just innately the communication of knowing that there's an audience at companies that really see the value and you know exactly why that would be the biggest uh, uh, sales enablement tool. So you're thinking sales, sales enablement tool more theoretically than literally in terms of whether there's a particular product or tool that you Correct. Use. I mean, there's a sales enablement tools are, you know, these days uh, it's become a, a much bigger marketplace uh, and there's a lot of, uh, uh, investing that's going into different sales enablement uh, software companies. Uh, you know, I think there's value in those sorts of uh, company tools, but I don't have a specific software product that I would, um, you know, um, totally uh, say is the greatest thing in the world. I'd, ha I'd have to um, really spend a lot of time evaluating. I think the theoretical aspect though, first and foremost is uh, what's needed. Okay, and the one thing that helps you stay productive and or focused? Um, I think knowing that you can win. Uh, if you feel that your hard work is gonna result in success, that keeps me focused. Uh, so, you know, on a daily basis, um, 
feeling that what I need to accomplish that day is something I can get done uh, enables me to stay focused on the task at hand. I think where people go off the, the rails is when they, they feel overwhelmed by a task or, or uh, a set of tasks that they have to do and, and whatever it might be. And uh, I think that's what keeps me motivated uh, is feeling confident that I can accomplish the goal. Best advice for first time sales leaders, what would that be? Well, I think the best advice I could provide is uh, don't be a stick leader. You know, don't, don't manage people from the vantage point of uh, putting fear uh, and intimidation into their minds. Um, and don't manage from the glass house. Uh, lead from the front. Um, everybody wants to feel that they can respect the person they work for and the people they work with. And the minute someone does not feel that they can respect somebody, uh, they usually zone out. So I, I have, in my experiences, uh, I know that there's a lot of stick leaders out there who seem to, for some reason, um, get long runs in, in different environments that they're in, but I've never been a, a believer in that. I think it's detrimental. Uh, if you're gonna become uh, responsible for other people, never never expect them to have full accountability. You're, you've got to have accountability just as much. And I would say, you've got to be held even more accountable. You can't run around telling people you're, you're memory, memoryless or expect the people on the front lines to do it all. That just doesn't work. And you're gonna, you're gonna build a negative, paranoid culture and it's going to be a, a, a revolving door. If you want a winning culture, lead from the front, you know, have, show passion, show humility, show empathy. What motivate, what, who or what motivates you um, to achieve, to achieve greatness? Well, I mean, I think part of it stems from, you know, uh, the fear of failure. Uh, and then when you start over analyzing the fear of failure, uh, life um, takes on a whole new meaning, meaning or, or, or lack thereof. Uh, you know, someone who I was always motivated by growing up playing a lot of sports, especially tennis, was Jimmy Connors, because to me, he was always a fighter. He was someone who he could be down two sets to zero. And he was not going to quit. He was not going to give up. And, and he, he wore his heart on his sleeve. And I know there's some people who aren't such a believer in that. But I love the fact that he was out there fighting. And you could, see, you could see him getting pushed down and getting back up. And I loved watching that. I loved watching it. And I respected it. And it reminded me of me. I mean, I've been pushed down a zillion times. But, you know, I, I keep getting up because there really is no alternative. That's why the Rocky movies are my favorite, in particular <laughs> Rocky IV, and why I'm raising yeah. my kids on Rocky movies. Um, there you go, yeah. That whole um, story of persistence and getting knocked down and getting back up, that's fantastic. And uh, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you if they want to learn more about you, um, perhaps hire you, um, or just perhaps maybe even just get additional advice? Uh, two ways. Um, they could uh, reach me through my work email, through my LLC, which is jeff.hoffman at rapidsalesrevenue.com. They can also call me up the old fashioned way. I'm, I'm always uh, open to people uh, calling me. Uh, even if I don't recognize the phone number, I'll, I'll, I'll take the call. And that number is 917-319-1359. You are the first person, I believe, in the, I don't know how, I don't know which episode this will be. If you're listening right now, maybe it's 20, 21, something like that. But the first person that's shared their phone number. So uh, ah, that, that's wow. cool. Puts All me right. in, in a, dated, a dated range, that's for sure. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but <laughs> certainly unique. Uh, I think one of my guests recently said, who I think I just published it today, which is the, what is this, May 18th? who said that, um, you know, that we got to start, stop calling it uh, a phone because it does so many other things. <laughs> and, right, right, right. Yeah, and he doesn't answer the phone, which is pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, Jeff Hoffman, thank you for 
going over quarter. Thank you so much, Jay. It's been a pleasure. Goodbye, everybody. I'm cueing the music.